Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Mike Munoz. I'm the president of Georgetown Law Federalist Society. Uh, on behalf of our chapter and on behalf of the uh, faculty division, um, we welcome you to our panel discussion on Supreme Court advocacy in the Obamacare cases. The Federalist Society is a nonpartisan, libertarian, and conservative organization dedicated to fostering balanced and open debate about the fundamental principles of freedom, federalism, and the rule of law. Uh, the Federal Society seeks to educate the legal, legal community through its programs and publications about how limited constitutional government based on the rule of law can have a positive effect on law and public policy. To begin, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Mr. Adam Liptak. Mr. Liptak is a Supreme Court correspondent for the New York Times, and his column on legal affairs sidebar appears every other Tuesday. Uh, he is a graduate of both Yale College and Yale Law School. Uh, and he practiced law at a large law firm in New York and is in the legal department in the New York Times uh, company before joining the paper's new staff in 2002. Mr. Liptak has been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Exploratory Reporting in 2009 and received the 2010 Scripps Howard Award for Washington Reporting. He is the author of To Have and Uphold the Supreme Court and the Battle for Same-Sex Marriage. His journalism appeared in the New York the New Yorker, Vanity Fair, Business Week, and Rolling Stone, and he's published articles in various law journals. Please help, please help me give a warm welcome for Mr. Adam Liptak. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Uh, all of those achievements pale in comparison to the four mentions I just find. He, that... he tuned right to the index immediately. <laughs> in this fabulous new book called Unraveled, which we're here to celebrate and discuss, um, I think, the, just by way of format, I'm going to introduce uh, Josh Blackman, the author of this book, and he's going to give us some, uh, set the table with some remarks. And then I'll introduce the other panelists, and we'll talk uh, some about the interesting uh, twists and turns that these uh, Affordable Care Act cases took. I know exactly when I met Josh Blackman for the first time. It was March 2nd of 2010, or maybe it was March 1st. It was the middle of the night, uh, and he was waiting in line to get into the Supreme Court to see the McDonald argument, the 2010 uh, Second Amendment argument. And I, I, I drew an instant uh, assessment of the guy. He seemed you know, goofy, unlikely to amount to anything. <laughs> And boy, has he proved me wrong. He is easily, in a, in a f uh, profession filled with hardworking people, he is easily the hardest working, most indefatigable uh, legal practitioner, commentator, blogger. He's written a second very good book, readable, reliable, uh, and uh, tremendously informed, and also reported in a kind of journalistic way that most law professors uh, don't do. So uh, I'm, I'm very impressed by him. Uh, he's soon to be published in the Harvard Law Review, um, and I'm pleased to introduce him to give us a sense of what this book is all about. Thank you. And, and, and lest you, uh, unless you think Adam is kidding, he actually quoted me in the Times that report. <laughs> I, I think I made Perhaps some... not in the most flattering way. No, it wasn't. Uh, so I, I had mentioned some comments about Fantasy SCOTUS, the Supreme Court Fantasy League, and Adam said, Mr. Black, that he was a czar of Fantasy SCOTUS. This is when the czars were, were big in, in topic. But uh, we, we've since become good friends. Um, so I am actually very happy that everyone's here today. Uh, this is a very important event to discuss the litigation. I promise we will not talk about broccoli we will not talk about taxes. We will not talk about what established by the state means. We will not talk about ERISA. We will not talk about self-insured plans, and we will not talk about substantial burdens. Instead, I want to focus on these individuals, oh, particularly Mike and Aaron, uh, uh, who were involved in litigation, and- I have nothing to say. And Marty, well, no, I think Marty has been one of the most perceptive observers of this litigation, and on the Balkanization blog, because we're in, Long, long, long blog posts that are actually very effective at setting the stage of everything. And I've learned more about ERISA than I ever wanted to know from Mr. Lederman, so I'm grateful. <laughs> so the ACA is a little bit over six years old. On March 23rd, 2010, President Obama signed this law, uh, uh, this bill into law. And within minutes, I think about seven minutes, litigation began. The state of Florida, the state of Virginia, and others challenged the law's individual mandate. That was the subject of my first event, and as we saw in 2012, the Chief Justice broke Randy's heart, and he upheld the ACA. 
But that was only the beginning. And since then, there have been three major Supreme Court cases, and likely a fourth will come back up, and maybe even a fifth soon. Um, the first case I want to talk about is one that Mike was intimately involved in, also Yakov Roth, who's a good friend, um, and that is a tax subsidies litigation. So the ACA uh, has a provision, Section 36B, which says subsidies are available on the exchange established by the state. I will not talk about what that means, but I do want to talk about how this litigation came to be. A benefits lawyer by the name of Tom Christina, who's from South Carolina, uh, was one day actually reading through the ACA, something the Senate never bothered actually doing its entirety. And he came across this provision saying, wait a minute, Section 36B, this means there are no exchange, uh, subsidies on this federal Obamacare exchange. Um, Tom got in touch with some of the attorneys at the American Enterprise Institute, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, people like Tom Miller uh, uh, and James Blumstein and others who started researching, saying, wait a minute, um, how can it be that the feds are putting subsidies on this exchange? So Christina and Blumstein started talking with different groups. They talked with Oklahoma, the Solicitor General there, Patrick Wyrick, and eventually they came in touch with Mr. Carvin. And the idea was hatched that they would put together a suit challenging the payment of these subsidies. But this is where litigation comes in. How you structure these cases is very important. And one of the first key decisions Carvin and his colleagues made was who should the plaintiffs be? Should it be a state? Should it be an employer? Or should it be an individual challenging this rule? After all, these are individuals who didn't make much money. And were it not for these subsidies, they would be exempt from Obamacare's mandate and penalty. It was a very narrow income ban. I know this because Yaakov actually emailed me asking if I had any friends who fit in this in this ban. He's like, Carvin's bugging me. Do you know any friends from Virginia who make between like $20,000 and $28,000 and they're not married and, and there are all these crazy formulas? And I was like, sorry, I don't know anyone. But they were able to find a number of plaintiffs, uh, among them Jacqueline Halbig, Dave Klemenchik, and a few other people who really hate Obamacare. So the first suit was actually filed in the DDC, about three blocks from here. And I want to talk about the litigation. Originally, the case was filed in DDC. It was Judge Roberts, right? Judge Roberts, who is no longer on the bench, Google why, to avoid any sort of libel actions. Um, <laughs> He did nothing in the case. They sought this case saying, look, the Obamacare exchange is going to open soon. We need to take immediate action. Nothing was done. So then Mike and his colleagues did something that I thought was a, a, something of a gambit. They moved for, uh, to reassign the case. They said, hey, Mr. Roberts, you were just assigned as chief judge of the district. Give this to some other judge who cares. Um, that's a risky move, right? Because you can piss off the judge if it backfires. But it worked. Within a minute, <laughs> Roberts like, off my plate. And he transferred the case to, uh, uh, what was it, uh, Friedman, right? To Judge Friedman. And then Judge Friedman moved quick, and he had the PI hearing, and I mean, everything moved very quickly. So that was, I think, the first tactical decision that I think made a lot of sense. It was a risky litigation move that panned out. The second thing that Jones Day and their colleagues did was they filed a parallel case in the Eastern District of Virginia. This is the rocket docket for those of you who follow uh, a federal practice. Why would they file the exact same case in the district across the river? They were trying to set up a circuit split. Before this case was even an, in, you know, even an inkling in Anthony Kennedy's mind, they were already trying to see how we get one circuit go one way, the other circuit go the other way. Now, the D.C. Circuit ain't what it used to be, right? When they first filed, uh, the D.C. Circuit had a majority of judges who are fairly receptive to the federal society. Um, throughout the course, that was no longer the case. So they had these two cases in Virginia and D.C., and they moved fairly at, at a quick pace after the case was reassigned. Okay, then what happened? It was argued for the D.C. Circuit and before the Fourth Circuit. And this, I think, is one of those crazy parts of the entire litigation. I think it was July 23rd, 2013. Am I right in the day? 2014? It was July 23rd. I was on a cruise somewhere in the Caribbean, and I got this email saying, they decided the substance litigation case. So in the morning, around 10 o'clock, uh, the D.C. Circuit decided a split panel with Griffith and Randolph, and then, uh, uh, was it Edwards and Dissent? Um, and, and they ruled in favor of the challengers. And then like four hours later, conveniently, right, the Fourth Circuit ruled for the government, creating an instant circuit split. This may be the fastest circuit split in the history of the world. Um, I think it's safe to say the Fourth Circuit was probably sitting on the case, waiting on that way that they can get the last word and not have the other judges in the D.C. Circuit reply. But within a matter of hours, you now had a circuit split. So this created a race. And this, I think, is one of the more fascinating parts of the case. Who was the racing? So the Carvin and the challengers, they wanted to get the case to the Supreme Court as soon as possible. The Solicitor General wanted the case to be stalled as long as possible, because the longer this is in effect, the harder it is to take away. So you have these what I call dueling petitions. 
You simultaneously had Mike Carvin filing a cert petition like in less than a week, and then you had the government filing a petition for rehearing on Bonk before the new nuclear DC circuit. Um, the, the next stratagem that Mike made was to preemptively oppose a motion for extension. So usually when you file a cert petition, the other side gets to file a brief in opposition. Um, as a matter of course, they can request an extension, more time. Mike was not willing to give them more time. So he sent a letter to the clerk's office saying, we would like basically the full court to vote on a request for an extension of time. Again, this was a gutsy move. Uh, not everyone was a fan of this move. Um, uh, but as I discuss in the book, uh, uh, it actually went up and uh, the granted the government's extension, but they basically said, don't do this again. They will not let the government stall. What happened next, the D.C. Circuit granted on Bonk. Um, this by itself was not uh, 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 controversial, except for the fact that this was certainly going to be resolved by the Supreme Court any minute. Why would they grant on Bonk, right? And there was a lot of discussion for whether they should grant on Bonk in this case. But then a few weeks later, SCOTUS grants certiorari. Adios, D.C. Circuit, you never get your shot at the apple. And once the court granted cert, and there were at least four votes for certiorari, uh, uh, that hinted to me that, wow, maybe there are four votes to rule for Mr. Carvin. Um, I was wrong. Or maybe something changed. We could talk about that later. But by the time this case was said and done, there were six votes to rule for the challengers. I'm sorry, rule against the challengers. And the rest is history. That was King v. Burwell. The second major case, which I'll do in tandem, involves the contraceptive mandate. Um, this may come as a surprise to many of you, but the ACA does not have a contraceptive mandate. The law is silent on contraception. Instead, there's a provision that says employers must provide for women, quote, preventive care. What is preventive care? I don't know. It's an ambiguous term. Let an agency decide under the Chevron principle. So the agency said we will cover the full range of FDA-approved contraceptives. But oh, by the way, there's no conscience clause for the um, uh, uh, this, this preventive care mandate. In fact, there's a conscience clause for the individual mandate, not for this mandate. So what followed is a very complicated series of rulemakings. By my count, there were six separate exemptions and accommodations crafted by the government. I name a number of them, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. We're now up to 6.0. And after each round, the government has tried to find a way to provide coverage of contraception uh, 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 while imposing a lesser and lesser burden on various religious employers. So to give you a sense, the very first round of regulations, the very first round, only exemptions were for houses of worship that, that focused primarily on people of their own faith. So imagine if you ran a church with a soup kitchen and you did not check baptismal certificates at the door, congratulations, you now are subject to the mandate. Uh, this was controversial and they tried a round two. Okay, so now if you are house of worship and even if you tend to people outside the faith, uh, you're still exempt. But that let charities like uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor and others uh, uh, outside the scope of the exemption. Um, after several more rounds of the rulemaking, they finally came to the proposal that, well, uh, uh, we're going to uh, say you don't have to pay for it yourself, but we will use your plan in a certain way to provide the provision of these drugs and services. Okay, so I don't want to get into the RIFRA, but the litigation aspect of this is which one would come first. The government, I think, here was very deliberate in putting out the rules for the for-profit corporations first. That's why Hobby Lobby came first. They did not want the first plaintiff to the Supreme Court to be these little nuns, right? They wanted this, you know, the, these for-profit corporations. Because after all, if they won with the for-profit corporations, they could still you know, lose for the Little Sisters. But if they lost for the nuns in the first go around, that was basically ballgame over for the government. Um, so indeed, the first case that went up was involving the for-profit corporations. By a five to four margin, the Supreme Court said uh, uh, a for-profit, I was actually kind of seven two, they said a corporation is protected for purposes of RIFRA. And then five four, they said that there's a substantial burden. And they said, oh, well, you know, if uh, 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 you can accommodate these nonprofits, why can't you accommodate Hobby Lobby? And this will come back up. So after another round of litigation, I think there were almost 70 cases filed across the country with religious nonprofits, uh, uh, the justices took it again. The second case was called Zubik against Burwell, which was argued by Noel Francisco, which is Mike's colleague, and uh, uh, Paul Clement, who's, who's Aaron's colleague at the new, newly dubbed Kirkland Bancroft. Is that what it's called? Or no? <laughs> Does Paul get his name the letterhead or no? No. Um, 
So uh, the second case was called Zubik against Burwell, and this was whether the so-called accommodation to the contraceptive mandate violated the religious freedom of a number of nonprofits. Now, I'm going to dwell on the Little Sisters for a second because Marty will kill me otherwise. The Little Sisters has something called a church plan, and I don't want to bore you with ERISA, but the long and short of it is under a church plan, the government cannot penalize them for failing to provide these drugs. So of all the plaintiffs, ones who get the most, you know, attention, uh, even during the arguments, Justice Alito said to the SG, so what about the Little Sisters? And the SG was like, yeah, we can't do anything about them. So there are other plaintiffs who are much less famous, who have much more serious claims. Now, I don't want to talk about RIFRA. I don't want to talk about how this litigation went down, which was frankly unprecedented. The case was argued. I was there sitting front row. I, I was sworn into the bar that day. And um, uh, 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 the justices seemed somewhat divided. A couple of days later, this order comes out. What's this order? There was a request for supplemental briefing. And the justices were saying, well, you know, you told us this. Is there some other way you could provide this coverage? Maybe if they don't object, maybe if you give some other kind of notification, there's something else you could do. Um, I think the SG and the, uh, you know, Aaron, how many parties were there? Like 20? I can't remember. 37. Yeah, the thir 37 parties. So they somehow came up with a single brief for, for the lot of them. And, and the short answer is, well, maybe we could do something with so-called uh, insured plans, but for you know, these called self-insured plans, not really. Uh, the government said, you need to have the same insurance plan providing seamless coverage. And the religious group said, no, 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 we, we, we need a separate plan, like you, know, you have a dental card or prescription card to provide separate coverage. Okay, so basically the party said, yeah, we don't really agree. And then the justices around May 20th released this order saying, great, you guys agree, go mediate. Um, and they remanded the case. Uh, uh, they, importantly, they vacated all the lower court opinions. That's why there was a decision. They vacated all the lower court decisions, and they remanded to, was it, five or six courts of appeals? I can't keep track. They said, you guys figure this out till we get another justice. Um, and and that, that was what I call the SCOTUS punt, uh, which will not be returned anytime soon. Um, but what was remarkable at this was the justices asked for this briefing, not based on changed circumstances, not based on new information, but because they couldn't work it out. And they tried to come up with something that looked like a judicial decision. It really wasn't. It was really a mediation order. And, and that's where the case stands now. Maybe uh, we can talk a little bit later. But the justices, because they're down to nine, punted. Um, what I'd like to stress is at every stage of this, lawyering actually mattered. Right? This wasn't a case where um, you know, the facts were set in the district court and everything was sort of cruise control all the way through. There was very smart tactics, both from the Solicitor General's office, uh, Don Verrilli, who retired a few months ago, um, uh, as well as from the attorneys at Bancroft, at, 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 uh, at Jones Day, and elsewhere, to find a way to litigate this case in the most efficient manner, get it to the court quickly, give them the arguments they need, uh, and then find a way to break Randy's heart time after time. Thank you all for your attention. I will intersperse my comments throughout, but I am very grateful. Adam, thank you so much. Thank you, Josh, for that really terrific, fast-moving overview, which I could, I could tell from even from where I'm sitting in the body language of the people down the road that you've raised lots of questions and they have things to respond to. Let me introduce them. Uh, you, you've, you've basically heard a little bit about them already. Uh, Mike Carvin is a partner at Jones Day. He's been involved in many of the biggest cases of our era, which before both Affordable Care Act cases, the Friedrichs Public Unions case. Uh, Aaron Murphy uh, is currently a partner at Bancroft for, what, a couple more days? And then she'll be a partner at Kirkland & Ellis. Uh, she clerked for Chief Justice Roberts and has also argued uh, some very important cases, including the McCutcheon campaign finance case and argued on behalf of the House in the immigration case, United States against Texas. And Marty Lederman is rivals uh, Josh in his <laughs> uh, blogging uh, prowess. Uh, you haven't lived until you've read the 36-part series on uh, church plans or something. Uh, They're very helpful, very he's helpful. He's a professor here at Georgetown, formerly of the Office of Legal Counsel, uh, and is a deep student of all of what we're about to talk about. Uh, Mike, why don't uh, you respond to some of what you've heard uh, from Josh on, on lawyering in particular and the choices you made in recruiting plaintiffs, whether it's correct that the reason you filed in the uh, Eastern District of Virginia was to create a split or perhaps you were just tired of waiting on the uh, D.C. District Court. Um, and, and then maybe a little bit about what happened between what looked like a very promising cert grant and a uh, less satisfactory from your perspective decision. Um, sure, I'm happy to. Um, 
Josh actually handled it very well in terms of laying the groundwork and the basic litigation decisions we had to make. If we're going to stick to the litigation as opposed to the substance of the case, I mean, the, the basic building blocks of any litigation are relatively straightforward. Who are you suing on behalf of? Where are you going to sue? And in this case, uh, when? Time was a very important element as well. So who? We had to figure out, as Josh has already indicated, we had to get plaintiffs in a relatively narrow band of uh, uh, income to so that they could establish standing. If, if you think about it, right, what was going on here was illegal was they were giving away money from the federal treasury. Well, who has standing to complain about uh, handing out uh, unwarranted checks from the federal treasury? You don't have standing to say, gee, I'm a taxpayer, don't do that. Uh, and the people who are receiving the checks typically are obviously not going to complain, gee, they gave me $10,000 and I shouldn't, shouldn't have the money. So, so the key to standing in this case was, if you got the subsidy, it would trigger the individual mandate. It would trigger the mandate that you buy insurance. In other words, there's an exemption for certain people who can't afford insurance, uh, therefore the individual mandate doesn't apply to them. But when they're figuring out whether you can afford insurance, they ask, what, how much money would you have if you got the subsidies, okay? And remember, our argument was that these states um, where these people were enrolled, like Virginia, were not, and the District of Columbia, were not authorized to give any subsidies. So we argued uh, the but-for cause of the individual mandate in this case is they are illegally receiving subsidies. As a consequence of receiving the subsidies, they now have a legal obligation that they would not otherwise obtain, i.e. the requirement to go buy insurance, and that was our uh, legal injury. And as Josh again pointed out, you needed to find people who had not so much money that they wouldn't, they wouldn't be eligible for any subsidies and not so little money that even uh, they would they would be exempt even with uh, the subsidies. So you had to hit, I don't know what the number was, say between 22 and 32,000, depending on whether you were married and those kinds of things. May I ask a quick math question? Would it be possible to construct the statute in a way that there is no such gap? Um, I would think it would be a relatively harsh statute, which would mean you'd make poor people subject to the individual mandate. Once you have any kind of income assessments, then by definition, the subsidies are going to be did you want to say? Yeah. Mike, what about the ideological commitment of your plaintiffs? That's, well, an, that's another good story that you have to find people really want to destroy Obamacare to, to stick through this. Yeah, right. You know, Judge Edwards, to jump ahead, was very upset that, that our, uh, our plaintiffs didn't like Obamacare. He thought that was a perversion of the judicial system because, we, as all we all know, people who sue on behalf of the Sierra Club and stuff really love the environmental regulations or the uh, toxic waste dumps that they're seeking to have covered up. He thought this was quite unusual that people were seeking to invalidate a regulation or a statute didn't like the regulation or statute they were challenging. So yeah, obviously we were looking for people. It wouldn't have made a lot of sense to walk through Union Station and say, the government's unfairly giving you $10,000 checks. Do you want to sue them for doing that? You would have to find people who had a non-economic motivation, which is a belief in individual liberty and a, an aversion to unauthorized uh, federal subsidies. So you find people like that, typically among conservatives, among what Hillary Clinton would call the vast right-wing conspiracy. Or the basket of deplorables. The basket of deplorables. And, and, uh, and so that's where we went. And we got, as has already been pointed out, Poor Dave Klemenchek, this wonderful guy in West Virginia, was our plaintiff in the first challenge uh, to the Constitution. He's a guy who lays carpets in West Virginia and has a very strong libertarian instinct. And uh, I remember he's like, you know, I, I could be like uh, Linda Brown. This could be my case when, when we win this. And I said, yeah, or you could be Plessy. So, uh, you know, it, it doesn't always work out the way you want. Uh, but. Uh, so nonetheless, he forgave me, and I came back to him a second time and said, we're going to get a second bite at the apple, and he joined on. And there was four or five similarly situated kind of people that, uh, that also satisfied the standing stuff. Government made a run at standing at the beginning. It was relatively pathetic. Um, the only interesting part was, uh, if you ever were worried about the Obamacare rollout, uh, the head of CMS, CMS, right, Yakov, yeah. filed three separate affidavits in court explaining what subsidies these people were entitled to and how much it would cost. And the first two, he said, well, excuse me, that was wrong. So the head of the guy running it had no idea how much, you know, 
insurance in West Virginia would cost off of the exchange. Um, but nonetheless, that basically they gave that up and it washed away by the end of the case, except in the Wall Street Journal, which kept running articles about um, one of my guys had Defense Department insurance in the 1970s. But basically, and, and Ruth Ginsburg asked about it at the uh, argument about whether or not uh, my folks had standing, but essentially that, that all went away. <coughs> um, so we had the people in place. Do you want me to go on to the next part? Yes, or is I, um, unless, unless Marty yeah. has something he'd like to add at this point. No. Well, apparently standing is unchallenged on this panel. <laughs> okay. um, so then where, right? And, and, and um, uh, Josh is right. Well, we, when we first sued in the District of Columbia, it was a very different District of Columbia than resulted after Harry Reid's court packing plan where he <laughs> o o overrode uh, filibuster and put uh, three new uh, judges on the D.C. Circuit within a couple of weeks. And so we thought, also, of course, it's the most natural place to sue. If you're going to sue a federal program, you typically just go to the District of Columbia. They're used to these <coughs> kinds of challenges. The immediate bad news, <laughs> not to speak ill of the recently resigned, but we did know the minute we got Judge Roberts, uh, wholly apart from any ideological stuff, he was just notorious for being the slowest moving judge in the District of Columbia. And time was of the essence, just to make it clear to you, they had not yet started cutting checks from the federal treasury. Uh, the, uh, the exchanges had not opened up. They opened up like in October, right? So we, from the beginning, it was a race against the clock. We were seeking an injunction, if at all possible, to stop all this before people started rearranging their lives, before billions of dollars were spent. Uh, and we thought, frankly, this was in both sides' interest, both the United States and our interest, to know the rules of the road before a lot of people had engaged in detrimental reliance on an IRS reg that could, could be invalidated. Um, so uh, the government, of course, had a very different view, which was to stall as much as possible to create uh, this sort of built-in, gee, you can't unscramble the omelet at, all, at this point. What the inherent unfairness of yanking away these subsidies that have already gone out would be a horrible, equitable uh, result. Don't do it. Um, and, and they also knew that if you were cutting a deal with states where you said, listen, if you go through the pain and political torture of establishing uh, your own exchange, we'll give you subsidies. If you don't, if you leave that all of that up to us, we'll also give you the subsidies. They knew the incentives for the states was not to uh, create their own uh, exchanges. And therefore, they could, as a direct consequence of the IRS reg, 36 or so states said, no, we're fine. We're going to let uh, uh, we're going to let you guys, the federal government, establish these exchanges. So they were in a really a slow uh, roll. Uh, rope a dope thing where they didn't want us to get into court. Judge Roberts was the perfect judge for them because he not only would not, they would, they would move for an extension for a month and a half on everything they had to file. It's not that Judge Roberts granted the extensions, he wouldn't even act on the extensions for the month and a half and then, and then the date would go by. And Yakov will tell you, I'm not the world's most patient person in all circumstances, and I was becoming a tad frustrated with the uh, pace of this litigation. Fortuitously, as Josh has also pointed out, uh, he was named chief judge in the middle of all this. And we had been looking for an excuse. There is a very unknown provision in the District of Columbia where you can ask a judge to transfer it to another uh, judge. And I was like, gee, I would never do that because it's so insulting to the judge. Um, but A, we now had an excuse with your new administrative responsibilities as a chief judge. You know, you should transfer it to somebody. And a partner in my firm had told me he'd been involved in a case with Judge Roberts where he didn't act on anything for two years until they asked him to assign it to a magistrate, which he granted in one day. So, uh, uh, so using that as our model, uh, we went ahead and filed this. And it's no exaggeration, three hours later, <laughs> Boom, Judge Roberts is like, good, transfer the case. Um, and it went to Judge Friedman, who ruled against us, but did an extraordinarily fine professional collegial, got, did his job uh, right away. So are, is speed of the essence uh, because you think you're going to get a nationwide injunction, or is speed of the essence because you want to get to the Supreme Court? Well, my view, and this goes to the split as well, Adam, um, the chance of going to the Supreme Court were much smaller, obviously, if we lost in the lower courts. If we had, if we had stalled this nationwide program, uh, 
there would have been a cert grant in a minute, even if we didn't have a split, right? If a, if a federal court- Would the government have gone straight to the court, skipped the Court of Appeals, do you think? No, I think they would have, go well, <laughs> under the old DC Circuit, they might have, but under the new DC Circuit, no, they wouldn't have. But my point is, if, it, if a, an appellate court had said, yes, this is illegal under the APA, um, I'm, we, I'm sure we would have gotten a cert grant. That said, just, we thought the other advantage, so one of the principal motivations for going to the Fourth Circuit, Virginia, was the rocket docket, and they're going to decide these cases really fast anyway. So we thought, well, okay, we're stuck in D.C. Let's go to the rocket docket. We'll get a decision. But it had the additional benefit of giving us two bites at the apple, increasing the chances of either a split or of having one of those courts say uh, state means state, and therefore the IRS regulation is, is no good. So from both perspectives, both in terms of enhancing our chances of Supreme Court review and getting timely Supreme Court review, that's, that's why it made sense. Uh, and then as Josh described, you get, you, you, you get the split, although in, in some sense, by the time the court takes the case, the split had disappeared. Because when going on bonk, the D.C. Circuit uh, vacated the panel decision, so you had no split, or did you still have the, uh, the shadow of a split? Mm -hmm. Look, we knew it was seven to four, a Democrat to Republican on the new D.C. Circuit, so I was not wildly optimistic about our chances on on bonk review. So we thought it was very important, uh, just, so just to be clear, same day, we win in the D.C. Circuit, and we lose in the Fourth Circuit. Like four hours later. Yeah, I mean, literally, I'm assuming, I don't know, they held the opinion and waited to see what happened, because we had argued the Fourth Circuit case afterwards. Um, uh, maybe I'll briefly describe both arguments. If, if so the D.C. Circuit argument, I had a very yeah. candid exchange of viewpoints with Judge Edwards. Uh, yeah, that's putting it mildly. The transcript is something to see. <laughs> I, I had the recording. It's, uh, he attacked my motives, he attacked my plaintiff's motives. It was, but as I say, it was, I won't get into the details other than to say, it was an interesting litigation decision. You have a voluble uh, judge on one hand who's gonna eat up all of your time, and the dynamic on this panel in the DC Circuit was I had Judge Randolph, who I felt quite confident about uh, a green state meant state, and Judge Griffith, who I thought I had a good chance at a green state meant state, but I couldn't get a word out because Judge Edwards was, uh, attacking all of these things. So at some point, you just have to sort of raise the volume, implicitly say, I'd really like to talk to a judge who's going to listen to my answers, and if we could just uh, call it for a while, which is basically what I did, and I got some words out in front of Judge Griffith. We go to the Fourth Circuit, um, and in the Fourth Circuit, you get your panel the morning of the argument. I looked at the panel, and I immediately turned to Yakov and said, do you want to argue this case? Because uh, <laughs> I said, I could go up and sing Broadway show tunes. I've got about as much chance of winning this case. As, either way, Yakov, being a profile courage, declined my invitation, and we lost. Uh, so we knew we were going to lose in the fourth. We thought we had a good chance in, in winning in, in D.C. Griffith looked like he was leaning our way. As you guys have both pointed out, they came down the same day, which was amazing. So we, now we've got to get to the Supremes, right? The good news is we've lost in the fourth, and this was part of our idea about having a split, because now we, unlike the government, is in charge of the timing of taking it to the uh, Supremes. And we knew that they would take a slow boat to China uh, <laughs> uh, on the DC circuit, because of course the longer, they would use up all their time on en banc and all of that and try and, try and uh, take as much time as possible to keep it out of that Supreme Court uh, term. So we filed, what was it, six days? We filed an immediate cert petition with the Supreme Court. At that time, I think, uh, we wanted to do two things. We wanted to get the cert petition on file before they'd filed their en banc petition. You got so the day before. It was the day before. So we could pretend, oh, really, are they thinking about going en banc? Well, there's a split in the circuits, and we could pretend that the uh, D.C. panel opinion was the last word. And the reason we filed this letter with the court on the extension by the SG was, the way it works is the SG just calls the clerk, and the clerk just grants the extension at least the first 30 day extension without any question. We didn't want that to happen because of all these timing issues. So we did write a letter saying we want the judge, justices to actually look at this motion. We had two reasons to do that. One is we were hoping um, that the government would have to file its uh, uh, opposition to our cert petition prior to a grant of the en banc. And I think 
by getting the extension, they I think the en banc was granted like what two days before they had to file their opposition. Mm -hmm. So they could write the opposition saying, "Look, uh, the D.C. Circuit's already granted en banc. Why do you want to wade into the?" Is that an example of simple math, Mike? <laughs> exactly. Well, right. Do so, I talk about the simple math comment? Which was remember with, with, with that guy from TPM, Harry Reid. Um, what this demonstrates uh, uh, is that Josh knows yeah, as every. Saying, I'll pass. As you say. <laughs> If I knew what TPM was, I uh, might talk, have... Talking point memorandum, the guy who wrote the thing about your comments about the new DC circuit and the math. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. So, yes, I can count heads, and I, yeah, I guess so. You need to be able to count to five and seven. Yeah, so, so let me ask about counting heads. Um, you got at least four votes for cert, uh, but um, six, six justices voted against you, and as I do the math, uh, somebody thought the case was important enough to take. Uh, but didn't agree with you on the merits. Do you think something of any significance happened between the cert grant and the decision? It sure felt that when cert was granted that you guys were in pretty good shape. Yeah, look, I, I vowed 18 years ago in a stack of Bibles I was never, ever going to predict how the Supreme Court uh, decided anything or why individual justices did what they uh, did. And I particularly vowed Cert grants really don't mean a whole lot, right? We, we, we know a lot of cases where they've granted and nonetheless uh, affirmed the lower court, um, and there's just a wide variety of reasons. So you can go from the mundane explanation, and usually Occam's razor, the mundane is the most reasonable, which is, we wrote, I think, not because we were great lawyers, because it was blazingly obvious that however you assess the merits of our challenge, it's in the interest of the country and in the interest of the United States government to know this sooner rather than later. Can you imagine if two or three years from now, all of a sudden, uh, the Supreme Court took a case, a split had developed, and they had decided after insurance companies had completely uh, gone into business, after people had rearranged their lives, after employers had come up with employment plans, and after literally billions of dollars had left the federal treasury, that the court says, no, sorry, this IRS regulation is not lawful. Uh, we made a very powerful point, uh, just to go back to the first Obamacare litigation, which is, <clears throat> we had won in the 11th Circuit in our challenge to the individual mandate. The government was completely open to the government, and I cynically always thought they were going to do this. They could have stalled after their 11th Circuit loss. If you remember, Randy, they could have gone en banc uh, in the 11th Circuit. They could have strung this all out and then um, uh, waited uh, and delayed resolution of the individual mandate. But to their eternal credit, they didn't do that because they knew that it was important to the country to figure out the constitutionality of the individual mandate before Obamacare was actually operative rather than afterwards. So they went uh, straight to the Supreme Court in those circumstances. We pointed that out in our cert petition and said they're in exactly the same position now relative to the DC Circuit, and yet they've gone on this path of delay. And that can't be justified under any kind of responsible rubric. So the long answer to your question, Adam, is I think it could have been four of them thought uh, uh, I was right. Could have been four of them thought he might be right. But whatever happens, we're sure going to decide it now rather than later. And it could have been that five of them thought I was right, and two of them got cold feet. And uh, for whatever reason, people do that. For whatever reason, people say state doesn't mean state. I can't. It's tough for me to compute that kind of legal reasoning. And um, so I don't know. But it's, it's sort of a fool's errand for me to explain why people come up with absurd legal rationales as opposed to explaining that the legal rationales are, are absurd. Uh, <laughs> Marty, you've probably heard a lot of things that you'd like to respond to. <laughs> I want to throw out one other possibility that the SG did a particularly good job uh, in, in briefing this case. Which possibility do you well, is most I, attractive? To I you? mean, I definitely think the SG did an excellent job briefing the case. I think um, that in both, actually, all three cases, uh, Sibelius, this case, and Zubik, um, obviously a lot of attention was given to the briefs throughout the department and by the Solicitor General himself, and they felt like cohesive, singular briefs with a single voice um, and a and a powerful voice, and it. You know, to me, I, I know Don really well, but it felt to me as though this felt like, you know, his voice. Um, and I think the justices probably thought that too. Now, that doesn't mean you have a winning argument. I did think they were very strong briefs. 
I don't know. I mean, who knows how many justices voted to grant cert and who they were, right? It could have been that there were four who were skeptical of the government's view and wanted to, you know, wanted to just bring it up and let the chips fall where they may. Could have been that seven or eight thought, let's get this over with. I, who knows? Um, I, I suspect that there were at least some justices who thought, well, maybe this will be resolved in the lower courts without a split. Um, and if it is, we never have to take the case. But I can imagine, in retrospect, now knowing what we know about the outcome, I can imagine the chief saying, yes, this is an important, you know, this has obviously generated a lot of controversy and a lot of concern, and it's a very major program that's at stake. Um, it, and let's just, let's get it over with. Let's get to the merits. And it could be that the chief and or Justice Kennedy thought from the outset this was an easy case for sustaining the government's view. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I certainly think those of us who did think the government had the better of the view um, were worried that the votes wouldn't be there, um, not because it was a hard case. I mean, I think, you know, if you step back from the beginning, it's the, to, if you now read the chief's opinion, uh, it's clear as day, and it always was to, to us what the right answer is. I mean, I, I, I'm curious what the audience, you know, folks who are in the Federalist Society or otherwise, think of this case. I thought of it as being very, very dramatically different from the Sibelius case. So in the Sibelius case, you have a fairly aggressive constitutional view being put forward, but one that's deeply um, sincere and, and deeply felt by Randy and others, and a real challenge, a very significant challenge to a view of the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause that has great implications going forward for federal power and for our constitutional system. Um, and what everyone thinks of the merits of that case, um, I understood why there was such passion and, and movement behind it. Uh, among people who felt like the court had in the last, you know, name your number of years, 30 or 80 years, gone astray in terms of affirming federal power. This one, to be honest, felt um, deeply cynical um, to, to those of us who were on the other side. There's only water in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no not, not cynical on Mike's part at all, or on the lawyer's part, right? The, so the lawyers were, the lawyers I'm up on the stage with and their colleagues are among the best uh, appellate advocates in town and extraordinarily principled and uh, deeply committed to their clients and their view, and I have no truck with them at all. But the basic movement behind it, as I think Josh describes well, is this is a statutory reading that until some South Carolina lawyer sort of tripped upon it one night, was not in the contemplation of, not, forget a majority of members of Congress, of not a single member of Congress, of not a single state legislator or state uh, um, administrative official who had decided not to set up an exchange. And it obviously did not, not only didn't reflect, forget intent, design, whatever you want to have it, of a majority of Congress, it didn't reflect the intent or design of anyone in Congress. And in fact, it was deeply, I, Josh, I'm surprised you didn't, I, what was the name of the first book? Unprecedented. Unprecedented, because the, the, key, the key word, the key adjective, in the, in the chief's opinion in King versus Burwell is untenable, right? This was an entirely, <laughs> this was an entirely un be I, a trilogy. <laughs> I just I thought the book was going to be called Untenable, <laughs> but it's not. So and unraveled, although it's raveled pretty well right now. Um, so the chief just thought this is a complete. Of course, the chief justice is the best lawyer in town, or you know, up there tied for first with other people. I don't want to insult anyone. Um, do you, do you think that about all his cases or just his Affordable Care Act cases? No, no, I don't think he's right. I disagree with the chief on the merits of everything, but he's an extraordinary lawyer and a careful lawyer and a former government lawyer. And it's not the sort of, I, I mean, I think the chief thinks of this is, an, in retrospect, now reading his opinion, thinks of it the way most of us thought about it, which is, of course not, right? This is, it would be absurd or untenable to think that the, it would be contrary to the, to the legislative design to use this kind of like, oh, in the, at 3 a.m. some South Carolina lawyer found a, a quirk in the, sta in the language of one of, uh, what did I say it was, um, uh, you know, 140,000 word statute, found one word, you know, the word in, if it would have been uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, the word by, if it would have been within, everyone would have been fine, there wouldn't have been any lawsuit. And to, to sort of hatch upon that and then go looking for plaintiffs who in fact are not injured really in that way. I'm not, not, there's nothing wrong with them being opposed to Obamacare and wanting to take it down. But this was obviously just finding a clever lawyer's way of bringing down the case, of bringing down a statute that a lot of people didn't like and thereby unraveling, there you go, Josh, unraveling what the, what the president and the legislature had done. Now, I didn't know whether that was the sort of thing that the Chief and Justice Kennedy would be willing to do. Um, it was very possible. I, I'll just confess right now, I was concerned that it was possible the chief could say, look, I, you know, I did my level best in the Sebelius case. I think it's within Congress's power. I've told you how I think it's within Congress's power. But if the legislature doesn't do its work the right way, um, in this case, I point the finger at Congress. And they messed up. And they may not have meant to mess up. But I'm not denying them the power to do what you guys want them to do. They just have to go back to the drawing board and do it. You know, if the chief were up, wanted to take down Obamacare, and if Kennedy wanted to take down Obamacare, certainly the, the path was there to do it. Tom Griffith had showed them how, how to do it, and Mike's brief certainly showed them the way to do it. But, but really, did anyone think this was the right answer, right? Did anyone think this, <laughs> this really reflected what any legislators, let alone a majority of the legislature, Does anyone really think the word state means state? Marty's, this, you want to know why people are passionate about this? Because Marty's gone on for 20 minutes. And what he hasn't done is discuss the language of Six a statute minutes. that was enacted <laughs> by two houses of Congress, but what he hasn't done, what he has done is engage in psychological evaluation of a bunch of congressional staffers and what the policy implications are of, uh, Mike. of, of just a second, of their mistake. If anybody wants to know how to interpret law, I refer you to Justice Scalia's dissent, which says it's of course absurd to interpret the words established by the state to mean established by the federal government. Since courts are supposed to interpret laws enacted by Congress, and since this theory that this was some 3 a.m mistake was completely refuted by the fact that the phrase established by the state appears 11, how many times? Seven times, there's actually, I can quibble with that, seven times in the statute. We're now not arguing it was a slip of the tongue, we're arguing that there was Tourette syndrome in the, uh, in the uh, committee where they kept repeating a phrase that they didn't mean. And then that's especially true since, of course, the phrase makes perfect sense because just like Medicare it, and Medicaid in the Affordable Care Act itself, it provided the states an incentive to undertake a unpopular plan. So no, if we're a nation of if we're a nation if we're a nation we of can law, reboot the case. if we're a nation of laws and not a nation of men, then we've got to adhere to the text of a statute. And this is not something that's living and growing and you know 250 years old. This is a four year year old statute and for the Supreme Court to ignore uh, the law as written in Obamacare can only uh, be called unraveling Obamacare Ooh. by people who don't understand what a law is. So I Thank failed you. in my moderating duties yeah, exactly. because we've made a solemn commitment not to talk about substance <laughs> yeah. and we're bleeding into substance. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm not trying to win the case. I'm trying to suggest that, fr that if this were any other statute but it was a major statute, but not a controversial one. No one would have thought that this is a good argument that can prevail before that can prevail before the court. One final point on that: if this was a mortgage deduction, if this was not the, a political hot potato, and you came in and said, you know, when it says established by the state, it means established by the federal government, would any court? Any federal judge in the country say, are you kidding me? It's only because Mike, of the political I... resonance of the Affordable right. Care Act that judges are so willing to pick teams and distort statutes. If this was in an apolitical environment, we all know what the answer would have been. And it's precisely because of the disrespect for the law and turning judges into uh, faux politicians that this got any kind of resonance with anybody. So in terms of picking teams, Mike, I think it's fair to say, I don't want to psychology, you know, psychology analyze Supreme Court justices, but I think there's a general impression out there, and there's good reason to think it, that Anthony Kennedy is no fan of, of the Affordable Care Act. The Chief Justice probably is not a big fan of the Affordable Care Act on its merits and a, a, as a policy matter. They weren't picking a team because they liked a particular outcome. They were picking it because they're good lawyers who understand, as the Chief said, that that reading would not only have a calamitous result that Congress plainly meant to avoid, no one could deny that,
but in fact would make mincemeat and, and an absurdity of, of the structure of, of, the, of, of the act by creating federal exchanges that couldn't do the work that the federal exchanges were meant to do. Okay. All I'm, I'm, not trying to win, I'm not trying to win the case, simply to say that in retrospect, I think the Chief and Justice Kennedy thought this was a fairly straightforward statutory case. But in fairness, I do think many of us worried about whether that was the tack they were going to take at the time. So let's, let's turn to, um, uh, that was a robust exchange of views, thank you. Um, <clears throat> let's turn to less controversial matters like religious freedom and women's health. Um, <laughs> Uh, Aaron, I, I know you're in, in the midst of this case, and there's things you can talk about and things you can't. But and I always get in trouble if I call it by its name. Would you would you give us a little bit of background on Zubik, or as Paul Clement insists on calling it, Little Sisters of the Poor? Yes, for us it's the Little Sisters case, but you know, reasonable minds can disagree on that piece at least. Um, yeah. You know, so uh, the the Little Sisters or Zubik case has has was a case that has just been remarkably constantly changing in every step of the litigation, at least where we've been involved. And, uh, you know, my firm, we weren't really involved in the lower court cases, so, you know, we weren't kind of building up this litigation. We principally have just done Supreme Court litigation here and, and in the Hobby Lobby case as well. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I guess one thing I would say at the outset is, you know, not to kind of, like, resist the premise of, of the event here. But I mean, I don't think about these cases, and I don't think we do in general, at, at, at least in, in my firm. As, I, mean, I don't really think about them as Affordable Care Act cases, as Obamacare cases. It's very different from, you know, I was heavily involved in the NFAB versus Sebelius case, and very different from King versus Burwell, which were really cases about, you know, the Affordable Care Act and whether it was going to exist or how it was going to operate and all of that. And I mean, for one thing, you know, as Josh pointed out at the beginning, all of this litigation about the contraceptive mandate, I mean, there is no contraceptive mandate in the Affordable Care Act. So, you know, right there, it's it's a little bit odd to think of this as kind of all about the, the statute itself. But apart from that, I mean, none of this is an effort to, you know, undermine the Affordable Care Act and get the, the law thrown out. I mean, I don't know what my clients think about the Affordable Care Act in general. This is not litigation brought by people who want to do away with the, the basic aspects of this statute. For all I know, I suspect a number of our clients are big fans of many aspects of the law. It's really just about the contraceptive mandate and whether it's going to apply to religious employers. So, you know, I think of these really as religious liberty cases that happen to involve a, you know, regulation that was promulgated or group of regulations promulgated under the Affordable Care Act. And I think that all makes it very different from a litigation standpoint, kind of at the outset. You know, it's not like someone went around asking the most sympathetic nonprofit organizations around, you know, we, we'd really like to have a group of nuns to lead this up. I mean, the Little Sisters of the Poor actually believe that this is wrong and violates their religious beliefs and are litigating for that reason and you know wanted people to bring suit on their behalf you know so it's it's all a very different dynamic in that respect now that said i mean obviously like with any case there's a lot of litigating strategy and tactics involved in getting a court to the supreme court a case to the supreme court and and what goes on with a case once you get there and i think even before the kind of extraordinary things that developed in this case with the passing of Justice Scalia. I mean, this all started in, in kind of an odd dynamic with the process of getting to the Supreme Court. And part of that is because when these cases started being brought, you know, at, at the outset, a lot of the plaintiffs prevailed in the district court but basically nobody was winning in the courts of appeals. So the, the decisions that were coming down in the nonprofit cases after Hobby Lobby were all going the government's way and all going the government's way on this threshold question of whether basically we even have a viable RIFRA claim to pursue in the first place. So when we got involved, the, the first sets of petitions being filed, when the Zubik petition was filed, when the Little Sisters petition was filed, you know, there was no circuit split. All of, you know, all of the courts had gone on the same way. And, and basically, I think there were 
six in a row or there were four or five in a row or something like that that all went the same way. So the initial petitions drafted, uh, filed in the case were filed without a circuit split and basically saying to the court, you know, this, we think this is very important and that you need to take this issue and, you know, we, we think ultimately that courts are going to disagree on it as evidenced by the district courts that came out one way, you know, but, but it was kind of, it, it wasn't as clear at the outset how the court was going to look at that when the petitions were being filed over the summer. Nonetheless, everybody was filing petitions very quickly. Um, you know, once the first petition was filed, I think within a matter of two months, you know, seven petitions had been filed and they were being filed within a week or two after decisions came down with, the clear idea that everybody wanted to be sure that, you know, when the court started looking at petitions and deciding whether to grant the case, their petition would be one of the petitions up there. So at the kind of early stages, you know, you have this question of, are we going to be able to get the court to take this right now? And, you know, we felt like there was a very good chance that they were going to take it anyway. But as the cases are just about to reach the court, we finally get the circuit split with uh, the Eighth Circuit coming out the other way. And at that point, you know, the government did what, what I think was the right thing to do. It wasn't 100% clear they were going to do it, but they acquiesced and said, you know, the court should grant cert here. So at that point, it was pretty clear the court was going to take up the issue. There still was a lot of a, a lot of back and forth about, I mean, the government said you should take cert, but we particularly think you should take this case, not this case. And basically, you know, they, they, they seem to really want to have the D.C. Circuit case up there, I assume, because they liked what the D.C. Circuit had had to say in its opinion. So there was still a lot of this kind of posturing about, you know, what cases were going to be taken and, and a lot of different thoughts about what was going to happen. I, for one, will say I did not really anticipate what did happen, which was the court just granted every petition that uh, that had come before it, which is, is not the norm when the court has a bunch of cases that involve the same issue. Usually they, you know, pick like one and they grant it and that's it and everybody else gets held and you wait in line and, you know, see what happens with the, the kind of lucky winner who got to go to the court. Um, but instead, the court granted seven petitions and then basically just said like and we would like the parties to come back to us with a reasonable view of you know how to manage briefing and argument so that we don't have too much of all that and 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 so right from the start you kind of had this odd dynamic of the court kind of being like we're, we're gonna make this really difficult for you and then tell you to work it out you know so maybe we should have kind of foreseen the things that would happen later no, I'm just gonna interject to have a conversation I've got in, I agree with everything Aaron has said so far including that I really do see these cases as very different from the Sibelius and King cases and not really about the Affordable Care Act but on this one I, I as I was thinking it through Aaron why did the court grant all of them I think by that point both the Solicitor General and folks like myself had been saying to the court, you know, you should not assume that these 37 plaintiffs are all similarly situated. Yep. There's really an incredibly complicated array of different situations, and the way the statutes apply to these 37 plaintiffs varies widely, was number one. And so I think the court, the last thing they wanted is grant in one case, and then it turns out there's seven different variations on it that they yep. didn't decide. But they didn't want to figure all this out at the cert stage, which is why they were like, well, you know, Noel Francisco and Paul Clement and Aaron Murphy, they, these guys, they're good. They'll figure it out. And you did. And, and the, the other reason, quite frankly, is that, you know, there was some competition here not between the Bancroft plaintiffs and the Jones Day plaintiffs. And the court thought rightly, and I was pleased about this, let's hear from both Paul and Noel. Uh, they're both excellent litigators, and they may have different perspectives on it. And so one thing that some of the justices thought might happen, and I definitely thought would happen as the case went forward, especially after the, you know, the, the, the homework assignment from the justices, was that the 37 plaintiffs may have varied you know, anywhere between one and 37 different views of what sorts of regulations would substantially burden their religious exercise and what wouldn't, and what they would be willing to accept and what they wouldn't. I really expected a much wider variety of perspectives from the 37 clients. And it turned out that wasn't the case. Miraculously, all 37 of them had the same moving religious views about substantial burden all the way through. Uh, not, not quite, so that the Jones Day client, the Jones Day brief was slightly different from the Bancroft brief on, on substantial burden in ways that only 
crazy people like myself could appreciate. <laughs> but more or less, it felt as though this was being driven not by the clients, but by the lawyer. The legal theories were being driven by the lawyers, not the clients. There's nothing unusual about that. That happens sometimes. But it felt a little disconcerting in the context of statements about what regulations would and which would not make them impermissibly complicit in sinful conduct. Although, you know, I'm, I assume that all 37 plaintiffs signed off on what Jones Day and Bancroft eventually wrote. But just in terms of, again, trying to figure out what the court was doing, I think they realized at a certain point that this was 37 cases, not one, and that they wanted to make sure they covered the playing field. Yeah, no, and I, I think, you know, I mean, you had different people saying, look, this case will give you the whole playing field, this case will give you the whole playing field, and I think some of it was kind of, you know, I mean, there was a bit of from the SG, like, we're telling you this is the case and you're fine. If you take this, you've got everything. And, and to me, it was like, you know, you know we're not, we're not going to start this whole thing out by deferring to anybody's views about the best way right. to approach this litigation, which which I think is fair. You know, I mean, and, and it is. It's, a, it's, it's an unusual case in that respect. Now, you know, I, I think that there's, you know, I would suggest you're drawing kind of the wrong conclusion from looking at what's going on in the briefs, which is, you know, I, I think that what happened is we worked really, really hard to to work with a group of individuals and group and, and you know people with different religious beliefs and different organizations to figure out where can we have common ground because it's not going to be helpful to the court if we're all writing briefs that are like hey I better drop this footnote to say just so you know you know plaintiff number 27 has a slightly different thought about this than plaintiff 26 and you know you just you had to kind of understand the way the court wanted to approach this and think about how can we take this to the appropriate level of generality that makes it helpful to the court at the same time as not asking anyone to compromise anything about their religious beliefs. And it also helped that, I mean, you know, for instance, I mean, I think it's right that, you know, all of Jones Day's clients in the matter are all part of the Catholic Church. So, you know, you kind of have to follow the views of someone at the top. So you've got a number of plaintiffs, but they're going to be in the same, you know, we had a number of plaintiffs who are, you know, the same religious organizations and use the same, uh, the, the, you know, part of the same faith and use the same insurers. And, you know, so, so while you have a lot going on, you know, there are things that made for commonalities in, in all of them to begin with, you know, but I, I, I will say, you know, I, I don't think this is, you know, anything anybody wouldn't kind of come to their own conclusion on. I mean, that was, to me, the the most, you know, it's challenging enough to have the court give you this really weird homework assignment. I'm sure it was just as challenging for the the, the United States to be told, like, which, tell which us. Which justice do you think uh, uh, pushed the, uh, the homework assignment, if you have to guess? I, I mean, you know, it, it certainly reads a bit like something that Justice Breyer had had Agreed. drafted, you know, Agreed. I mean, whether Agreed. it was him who pushed the whole idea or like him who put pen to paper, you know, is harder to say. Yeah, there's um, just one sentence in there that says, well, talk about this or anything else you want to talk mm -hmm. about. And that's such a Briarism. I, I think so it's very likely that Briar was involved in the drafting of it. Whether I'm, I'm sure the chief and, and Justice Kennedy had a role in, in, in putting it together, too. Uh, you know, the, the general impression out there, I mean, I don't know what Adam has written about this, I forget, is that the court must have been split four to four, and this was this was an effort to either punt the case or resolve it, somehow get rid of the four-four split. I'm not sure it ever got to that, to a vote yeah. of four to four. I have a feeling they realized an oral argument even more than in the briefing, oh my goodness, this is really complicated. Justice Kennedy had already demonstrated in Hobby Lobby that he really wanted a solution under which on the one hand, no one felt as though they were being compelled to do something that was contrary to their religious beliefs. And on the other hand, all the women employees and beneficiaries of all the groups would, get, would in fact get cost-free access to contraceptive care. He was really hoping for a win-win situation and was trying to prompt the, all the parties to come up with one that did that. I think it was a you know, it was a pipe dream. It was never going to happen. Although, I never say never. Who knows what's going on now? Can I ask you? But um, I, I'm not sure the court, you know, maybe they never took up a, a vote as such. Maybe they went into the conference room and Justices Breyer, Kennedy, Roberts, et cetera, said, you know what, the, we don't know 
we could guess what would satisfy everyone, but we don't know. There's 37 of them and there's a government. Why don't we put the burden on them to try to come up with something where everybody can say kumbaya. Can, can I just ask, because that's a fair point, and that's certainly one way to interpret what happened, but either you or Aaron. Being in the argument, um, it seemed to me that, that the notion that, that there was going to be this kumbaya moment where these parties could agree was just not <laughs> remotely feasible. So the more cynical explanation is they were just punting. And I'm just, and I'm obviously asking you both to wildly speculate. Did they really think something could have been hashed down? But, but Mike, consider the alternative because a 4 4 split leaves in place varying uh, circuit court decisions. And I think the Little Sisters themselves would be under different legal regimes in different parts no, of the country. No, 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 good point, Adam. And, that, and But Marty was floating, which is not unreasonable on its face, that it wasn't the 4-4. Only four. on the surface. It's not, it wasn't the 4-4 four four that drove this effort, that Justice Breyer was genuinely conflicted and Justice Kennedy no, I mean, like, wanted, look, obviously uh, you wouldn't um, even be in the position, like, if, if I don't think if they weren't an eight- justice court that you would have in the, been looking to do anything different than like just, a normal vote and I'm figure not, it out. I'm not but. sure. I'm not sure. I don't think Justice Kennedy, for one, maybe Justice Breyer, was keen on a result that either compelled people to do something contrary to what they said were their religious obligations or that would deny the women the, yes, the benefit. Yes, but that's because you're of the view that we didn't offer options that allow women to get the benefit. And, you know, well, it, you agree? nobody knows substance, where if substance, the justices substance. agree with you on that. No, but so. would, would you agree that under your proposal, yeah. many of the women will not, in fact, get the benefit? No. I mean, they just won't. It's just about, no matter how they get it. No, no, so, but in you know. fact, in the world, those women will not get the benefit. No, I mean, because we, it would require offered, it would require so Congress to go and appropriate on, I mean, funds. You're you're focusing in on particular. I mean, there's many different things that have been offered up. And I mean, one other th kind of thing that's been in my mind that uh, who knows may have had something to do with why they did the supplemental briefing order is, you know, I think there's been some mis a, a lot, frankly, of mis conception about the position of our clients throughout this litigation. And maybe some of that is, you know, the product of statements that weren't as clear as they could have been early on in the litigation. But, you know, by the time we got to the Supreme Court, I thought it was pretty darn clear that, you know, our clients aren't trying to keep anyone from getting contraceptives. And, you know, nonetheless, when we filed this supplemental brief saying that for about the hundredth time, it was like as if that were big news to learn that, you know, that, that they're okay with people getting the coverage and even getting it through the same insurance companies that might be the insurance companies that they use, you know, but, but given that so many people continue to treat that as like a surprising development every time they learn something that we've been saying over and over and over again all along. I mean, like it, it's not out of the realm of possibility to me that the justices kind of had this disagreement amongst themselves of, you know, well, I think they think this, I think they think this, and they're in this unusual situation of the eight member court saying, well, you know, let's like really, really put that to them and ask them if anybody thinks there's a way to do this, you know, consistent with the idea that it would be a single insurer. Let me ask one last question and turn to your questions. Let's assume that on remand, all 37 parties come up with some solution that's satisfactory to them, satisfactory to the government, that still doesn't bind everybody else in this position. So, I mean, it's, it's still a weird solution on the court's part. Or am I wrong about that? I think you're right. I just think it's, if, if there were this magic solution, I'm very dubious that there will be. And I think that's what Josh writes in his book as well. Um, but, but, but maybe. You never know. And if there is, I think it would be pretty difficult for a new plaintiff to come forward and try to make the case and have a great deal of sympathy after all of these Catholic organizations, all of these evangelical organizations, the United States government have all said this is okay. Yes, of course it wouldn't as a logical matter defeat their RIFRA claim. It wouldn't preclude them from raising it. It is interesting to me, for instance, that there, I think, tell me if this is wrong, Aaron, since the Burwell compromise, or I'm sorry, the Zubik compromise, I don't think a single for-profit plaintiff has come forward and tried to assert a RIFRA claim. They're all waiting to see what the result of this is before they go back to the well, or maybe they're all satisfied with the, with, with, with the accommodation. They're waiting. Right? So they're waiting. I just think you're right, Adam. It's, it's a theoretical possibility, but I think the courts would in short order say, 
sorry if it's good enough for the 95 percent I see. We're going to figure out some way that it's good enough for you, too. Erin, any final thoughts before we... I'll leave that. Okay. <laughs> Questions for, for this terrific panel? Yes, way back there. Speak up. Uh, my name is Baby uh, and my question is, uh, I guess, you might have mentioned earlier, I came late, how do you feel about uh, test cases or trial cases, you know, where uh, it seems like the lawyers are kind of more thinking about the theories? Uh, and my and the example that I would highlight is uh, the affirmative action case that came before the court involving the University of Texas. Now, I think that say what you want about affirmative action. I think it's kind of tough on the merit to say that someone who uh, that the drawn up for a case, you know, was wrong by not getting into UT. Uh, if I remember correctly, only 40 people had gone into the school who had either a lower SAT score or a lower GPA, and given that this big powerhouse for Division One sports school, you know, I mean, like, there's a high chance that, you know, a lot of those were athletes, and only three of those people were African American. Uh, and so I think that was a really, really tough sell, and I kind of wonder how you feel about situations like that. So, okay. so I'll, I'll, I'll take the first step. So the idea of a test case um, is not invented by Mike Carvin and Jones Day. If you go back and look at Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, they were really good at finding plaintiffs. I mean, if you look at the, the plaintiffs, you mentioned Linda Brown, they picked some really cute kids, right? And th that was not inadvertent. They wanted people that you would tug on the hearts for and have sympathy for. Um, so there's a lot of merit to building test cases. Um, in the King litigation, Mike and his colleagues worked very hard trying to find people that's the exact income band that would fit it, who also had a sufficient ideological commitment. Um, I read about the Little Sisters. Uh, I spoke with Mark Rienzi, who works at the Beckett Fund. Um, the Little Sisters didn't want this case. They were, in fact, one of the last ones to file. I think they filed, like, in September, and the mandate would kick in in December. They were among the last ones. Well, I mean, and, they didn't want to have to litigate. Yeah, it's, yeah, not like they, I mean. it's not like they were like, no, no, we'd like to sign this, but you convinced us to file a no, lawsuit. No, I mean, like, they, didn't, they didn't want to be involved in this. Like, they, 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 this was not something that these people wanted. They were a humble order of nuns, right? They, this is not something that is in their mission to go to federal court. Um, but you have these dichotomy, right, where this mandate was brought to these religious groups, whereas with the uh, king Sibelius litigation, these plaintiffs were sought out. Um, so I, I do think there's this dichotomy, but you have to have lawyers who are smart enough to make a test case where everything's clean and neat, and you can get people up. The, the Fisher case you mentioned was tough because she has since graduated, and, and there are all these factors whether she would gotten in anyway, and then the standing issue, there was a mess. But here, you have some smart lawyering to make sure this was a valid case. But it's, I, it's a I'll profound supplement that response. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. It's a profound question you ask, because in many legal systems around the world, constitutional courts are allowed to decide questions in the abstract. And it's a curious thing, let's assume affirmative action is unconstitutional, that we would never learn that except un unless there's the happenstance of some student who wants to be the, the poster child for that theory. So there's something to be said for these test cases to make sure that if the government in Mike's case is unlawfully spending billions of dollars, that somehow we get an answer to that. And that requires finding people who can serve as vehicles for that. And and the final point I'll make on that is just because public interest groups or other lawyers are providing free assistance to somebody <coughs> and coming up with a, quote, test case, in no way suggests that there's not a very serious group of people who, for example, affirmative action. There may well be a lot of people out there who think affirmative action is unfair, illegal, and unconstitutional, but they recognize that the uh, think about what you'd have to go through to bring litigation, particularly if you're only going to be in a school for three years. So there's a great universe of people out there who profoundly object to it, both on legal and policy grounds, but nonetheless, because of the way the legal system works, feel that they can't uh, bring that case, just like Linda Brown couldn't have brought that case without the NAACP. So the notion that it's that a test case means lawyer, spon lawyer motivated, that the cases wouldn't have existed but for the lawyers, I think Meg have it backwards. I think that there's a need out there, a market out there for lawyers, and, and the lawyers are stepping in to help people who otherwise couldn't get assistance in the normal course. I, and I, I tend to agree with most of what um, the others have said. Um, there was a problem with Alice Fisher standing because of the unique circumstances, but that, that's sort of a hard context in which to have you know, it's more of a problem of standing doctrine than it is fairness. There, you know, there is some notion that people ought to be able to sue um, 
that someone ought to be able to sue, and there's nothing wrong with that. My concern about the Little Sisters in particular being made the, the lead plaintiff uh, or, or trying to make them the, the lead plaintiff is not that they're being insincere or the lawyers are being insincere, but from the start, um, it was just clear to those of us looking at the case carefully, and this is in Josh's book too, that the Little Sisters, their employees were not going to get the contraception coverage under any circumstances. So there was nothing for them to be, compl no sin for them to be complicit in. I don't know if they knew that or, but it was, it just struck me as a, you know, the not the. has consistently taken the position that it perhaps will try and get someone else to give them. To, to Correct, give them but Little the Sisters, there, there's this, the, the Little Sisters has at least two third party administrators, I'm not going to get deeply into ERISA, one of whom has said it won't provide the coverage and it doesn't have I mean, to. I said the, no ERISA, that's a ground the rule. Second, no the, ERISA. Second one, <laughs> the second one, Little Sisters could tell, don't, if you want to be our third party administrator, don't provide the coverage. So there's nothing, Little Sisters has it completely in their control not to be Just that, which is why I thought the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. was a pl you know, plenty sexy enough lead plaintiff that ought to have been the, the case that was really sort of a nice way of looking at the case to understand to understand well, fun fact, it. Fact, the lead plaintiff for the Roman Catholic presider of Justice Scalia's mass. Ooh. So it, it, I'm not sure it matters who the lead plaintiff is, right? There was just if it weren't little sisters, if I'm right that there there's nothing for them to be complaining about. There are there's the East Texas Baptist, East Texas Baptist University, which does have a complaint based on the theory that of complicity that they have articulated. So there would be someone out there out there doing it. Um, so finding clients and finding the right clients who are sympathetic in the public eye or in the justice's eye, it's that's you know, that's what lawyers do yeah. to a certain extent. I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with it. Are right, there questions? Just, can I just to, just well, just because you you know okay. let me, let me yeah, just yeah, ju so just to be clear, Aaron, yeah. the reason the little sisters of the poor have a lawsuit is because they have been told that unless they sign a document right. that they believe violates their moral views, they will be fined millions of dollars. That was the posture of this case until the Supreme Court put out its order in Zubik. So if there was nothing to be gained, the government well, could actually, have long ago said, you don't Marty, have to sign Marty, this. Marty, I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But there wouldn't have been any contraception. We're, we're, we're out of time, but I feel I should take one last question. We only had one. Is there someone with a quick question before we call it a night? Or, or does that, did I discourage you from asking that last question? There may question? be quick questions. Okay, yeah, we, quick questions. we have a couple no minutes. Quick answers, Is there anything you're <laughs> eager? Yes, sir. Between uh, King B. Burwell and Scalia's passing, is uh, fidelity to the text of statutes for the purposes of the dead? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> Um, Randy, you want to take that one? <laughs> uh, no, there'll they'll be great fidelity to Texas statutes if they don't care about the policy results. But if, if the policy results, if the text leads to a policy wrote with which a certain kind of justice disagrees, then there won't be any fidelity to Texas. I mean, I, I think that, you know, we, we are hardly about to revert to some world in which justices don't look at the text of the exactly. statutes anymore. There have always been cases where you can debate whether they were being faithful to the text of the statute or whether they weren't. I mean, uh, you know, do we have fewer very strong textualist voices on the court right now? Yes, but I, I think it's going to be a long time before you see the days of people writing briefs where they don't quote the text of the statute because who cares about that? Right. right. Please join me in congratulating Josh on his book and thank you. Thank you, Josh. And on behalf of the Georgetown Law Federal Society, thank you for all the panelists and thank you for all coming. Um, we do have a lot of food and beverages out for reception immediately after, so please join us. Thank you. Thank you.